Welcome everyone. We're gonna give it just a moment to make sure that everyone um, has a chance to join us. Um, while you're waiting, if you wanna go ahead and uh, tell us where you're coming from, you can put that in the chat, as well as um, what utility you're purchasing your power from. Uh, I always like to know that um, on these things because it, it matters when we're talking about taking community control uh, of our energy systems. So I can start, I'm in Blacksburg, Virginia Tech Electric Service is my utility. For the Recording energy. in progress. I'm from Rowan, Virginia, and I'm uh, very much interested in watching the country turn green. I had the occasion um, to have acreage in Wisconsin and planted 30,000 trees with my three boys and wife back in oh. the 70s, <laughs> and they have uh, grown reasonably well. All right, well, we're happy to have you with us. Um, and. Yeah, if others want to chime in uh, in the chat, name and utility, um, I'll give it one more minute and then we'll get started. Um, and I apologize for the beeping as people are coming in and out. I don't know how to turn that off. Um, I should probably know that after a year or so on Zoom, but um, hopefully it won't be too distracting tonight. Um, all right, so just looking at the chat, it looks like we have people from all over, um, from APCO uh, here in the southwest part of Virginia to Dominion over on the eastern side, um, as well as Joey from out of state. Um, <coughs> um, all right, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, we might have some people joining us uh, as, we, as we continue, but welcome to our second event in our series energy democracy in action. Um, as you all know, tonight we are gonna be focusing on energy infrastructure and where it's located and how communities um, can try to gain more control over decisions around the location of the good and bad um, parts of our energy system. Um, so my name is Emily Piantek. I'm the energy democracy field coordinator with Appalachian Voices and I'm based in Blacksburg. And when I was prepping for this event tonight, I was thinking about, you know, what, why am I here? What, what brings me to this work? And in addition to my concerns related to climate change and, and the environmental justice impacts uh, of that, I'm also just really passionate about governance um, and democracy in general, and just ensuring that people have a voice um, to influence decisions uh, around systems that impact them. Um, so also with me tonight is my wonderful colleague, Jessica Sims, and I'm gonna give her a chance to introduce herself. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, like Emily said, I'm Jessica Sims. I'm the Virginia Field Coordinator for Appalachian Voices and work primarily on our campaign to stop fossil fuel infrastructure and new fossil fuel infrastructure within the state. And really happy to hear uh, about tonight's program. Yeah, thank you, Jess. And Jess is the wonderful sort of tech person tonight. So she'll be sharing um, her slides and doing all of that. Um, so big thanks, big thanks to Jess. Um, and on that note, next slide. Um, so some of you may be familiar with Appalachian Voices, but for those of you who are not, um, we're a regional environmental organization. Um, we got started in the late 1990s fighting mountaintop removal. Um, we're located in Virginia, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Um, and since our early days, we've kind of expanded our work from fighting mountaintop removal to a broader range of energy and economic uh, justice issues overall. So we work on some energy policy, um, including solar development and uh, availability, as well as just transition opportunities for the coal field communities um, that we also work in. Next slide. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to share a quick roadmap of what you can expect for tonight. So we're gonna start, I'll be giving a brief introduction to what I mean by the concept of energy democracy. Um, then we'll hear stories of success from our panelists who will be talking about um, instances where communities have fought for control over energy infrastructure um, and how they've been how they've been able to um, make their voices heard. Um, and we have three wonderful speakers with us tonight uh, to speak on that for a little while. Um, and then we'll close with time for your questions and then a few announcements at the end. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, so I think in kind of in addition to the roadmap 
where we're heading logistically tonight, I also wanted to talk a little bit about what I'm hoping we achieve together tonight. So the first thing is um, some shared learning around what our energy system looks like, um, as well as what it means um, to have energy democracy in your communities. I'm also hoping that we leave tonight with a sense of empowerment. Um, I'm hoping these stories of success from our speakers will resonate with each of you um, and inspire you to engage in this work in your community. Um, and then on that note, just hoping that we're able to grow a stronger movement for energy democracy in the region um, by connecting folks here tonight with um, resources and with other advocates who are interested in doing this work in their communities or maybe already doing this work in their communities. Next slide. Um, yeah, so I think it's helpful to begin uh, with a picture of what our energy system actually looks like. Um, so on this slide, you know, you can see this is a pretty basic graphic. But here on the left, we have a picture of a power plant or a generator. Um, and then we have the power lines, um, the substations and transformers. All of these things are responsible for bringing the electricity that's produced in a power plant uh, to, to your home. So electric utilities control many of these aspects of the system. They're responsible for generating power from coal plants, hydroelectric dams, um, solar facilities, wind farms, things like that. Um, utilities also manage or maintain energy infrastructure, and they're responsible for the distribution of this power directly to you. Um, many utilities provide a portion of, generate a portion of their power supply on their own, so they might own a power plant um, of whatever kind, be that, you know, a coal plant or a solar array or something along those lines. Um, but they also, you have to purchase from a regional electricity market the power they don't produce. So in addition to utilities who are generating power, you also have private companies who are generating power as well and then selling it into a regional electric market. And that's where you, your utility will purchase the power it can't generate on its own um, from just to meet demand and make sure there's enough to supply all of its customers. Um, in Virginia, our utilities participate in the PJM market, um, which is a regional electric market that serves 13 states across the Southeast. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so here I just wanted to share some pictures of what all of this actually looks like in the real world. Um, so, you know, on the left, we have a picture of a coal mine. We have a picture of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, which is a natural gas pipeline in Southwest Virginia that's currently um, under construction, um, but also being actively fought against by communities around the state. Um, we also have pictures of um, different distribution infrastructure. And then over here on the right, rooftop solar panels um, and a wind farm. So as I mentioned, utilities own some of this infrastructure themselves, but so do private companies. So you may have heard of the now bankrupt um, Black Jewel Coal Company or Bluestone Coal Corporation, which is owned by Governor Jim Justice in West Virginia, and which is, is mining coal in that state. Um, here in Virginia, Dominion and Appalachian Power are examples of two utilities which own a lot of energy infrastructure. Um, and then you know, I think it's interesting because we have it on this slide and also it's located um, in communities that Appalachians is actively working in. The Mountain Valley Pipeline is owned by Mountain Valley LLC, but shareholders include Equitrans, Midstream, Next Era Energy, and Consolidated Edison. So there are a lot of stakeholders at play um, in the energy market. So before we move on from this, or sorry, in the energy system, and before we move on from this slide, I did want to ask um, folks to come off mute uh, if you're if you want, or you can add it in the chat. But what kind of energy infrastructure are you seeing in your communities? Um, I can just say um, here in Blacksburg, I walk around my neighborhood and I can see solar panels um, on various roofs um, on the farmers market downtown. Uh, but I also can hop in my car, drive a short distance, and see the Mountain Valley pipeline under construction. So. Um, yeah, what, what are you all seeing in your communities? Anyone? I'm interested, I wanna build a picture. Uh, offshore wind, okay, solar, 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 that's great. Uh, what else? More solar on rooftops. More solar on rooftops, yeah. I'm definitely noticing a lot of that uh, proliferating as well. Um, in addition to the, you know, poles and wires, which are ubiquitous and which we're seeing everywhere. Um, if something comes to you and you want to add it to this conversation, you can just go ahead and pop it in the chat. Um, but uh, for now, let's see, oh, we've got a little bit more. Power stations, 
the Lake Anna nuclear plant, um, electric vehicles and charging stations. Yeah, um, electric vehicles are increasingly being used um, to, to provide services to the grid. Um, and they're proliferating as well as they become cheaper. Um, all right, cool. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, let's move on. Next slide, Jess. Um, awesome, thanks. So this is a picture of um, the, uh, the energy that is actually being generated in Virginia um, as of April, 2021. This is from the US Energy Information Administration. Um, and so um, the power that is being produced here in Virginia, uh, we've got a lot of it coming from natural gas. We've got coal, we've got hydro um, from dams in the state. We have um, a couple of nuclear power plants and we also have petroleum. So other types of energy infrastructure um, that, produce, that produce power in the state would include wind farms. Um, we have also offshore wind being developed off the coast of, of Virginia. Um, we have batteries and pump storage, um, as well as pipelines. Maybe I mentioned that already. Um, so all of this power production involves facilities that are located across the state. Um, as many of you mentioned in the chat, you know, you're seeing these in your communities, um, these types of infrastructure. Um, and so the question that comes to mind is, well, we have power plants, we have uh, pipelines, we have poles and wires. How is all of this regulated? So it's regulated at two levels. We have the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or the FERC, which regulates regional electric markets. And so remember, um, utilities in Virginia are participating in the PJM market um, and that's regulated at the federal level. Um, and the FERC also regulates um, the interstate transmission of power. So this would mean that they're making decisions about pipelines that cross state borders like the Mountain Valley pipeline um, and the now canceled uh, Atlantic Coast pipeline. So that's at the federal level. Uh, at the state level, we have the State Corporation Commission, Commission um, or the SCC, which regulates utilities here um, and primarily makes rules related to your electric rates, um, a renewable energy portfolio standard that your utility might have to adhere to. The SCC also makes decisions about a utility's integrated resource plan. Um, this is a long-term planning process that utilities have to go through um, every couple of years, and so state regulators will Will participate in that process, um, as well as decisions about um, new power plants and whether or not those can be built and where they can be located and things like that. Um, so that's kind of a big picture of what's being generated here and how it's all being regulated. So with that, um, let's move to the next slide, please. Um, great, so this is a map um, of the state of Virginia. And Virginia has 32 electric utilities that operate across the state. And each of those is guaranteed its own unique service territory and customer base. So these utilities are operating without a threat of market competition. This system was developed in the late 1900s. It was a way to, um, sorry, early 1900s, mid 1900s, seems like a long time ago. Um, it was developed in order to incentivize utilities to, um, to build infrastructure out and to provide power to people even where it wasn't necessarily economically feasible for them to do so. Um, and in return for having a guaranteed customer base um, and no threat of competition from um, other electric providers, uh, utilities are expected to serve the public interest. So they're expected to you know, provide electricity at a fair and reasonable rate to you um, and state regulators, so those at the State Corporation Commission or SCC, decide what's a fair, um, what's a fair rate of return or profit for that utility in exchange um, for the lack of competition. So by prohibiting market competition, or by the lack of market competition, monopoly utilities also can make it difficult for people to produce um, power on their own or to participate in um, you know, shared solar systems or things like that. So, um, you know, just looking more closely at the map, we have here in the red, this represents Appalachian Power, um, which is a big investor owned or private utility in the Southwest part of Virginia. Um, and Appalachian Power does not allow its customers to participate in community solar. Um, so community solar is usually a great option for people who can't put solar on their roof for whatever reason, or maybe they're renters um, and can't, um, can't have an array because they don't own their home. Um, and so community solar allows people like that an opportunity to participate in solar, which is cheaper, better for the environment. Um, and APCO doesn't allow that. But here on the right side of the map, um, all of the yellow, that indicates the service territory for Dominion Energy, which is another investor owned or private utility in Virginia. Um, it's the biggest one or serves the most customers in the state. 
and they do allow some limited community solar options. Um, so that's an example of a utility kind of making all the decisions about um, its customer base, even though it's not equitable or fair. Um, and so this brings us to energy democracy um, and just thinking about how can we remake our energy system so that the ability uh, for people to participate in decision making around the power system um, around where energy infrastructure is located um, is available to them. Next slide, Jess. Um, awesome, thanks. So energy democracy basically just means ensuring that energy resources are under community or public control. Um, and it was sort of developed within this umbrella of energy justice. And so thinking about, you know, how can we redevelop our energy system so that communities have more say, as well as um, redeveloping it in a way that minimizes environmental harm um, and protects vulnerable or marginalized people and not just protects them, but delivers uh, greater benefits to them than what they've seen in our traditional energy system. Next slide. So um, at App Voices, we like to think about energy system as being characterized by three separate pillars. So we think about how energy is produced. Um, so we think communities should be able to have more control over that. We also think about the siting of energy infrastructure. And again, communities should be able to have more say over that, as well as how much energy costs and how affordable it is to all people um, and ensuring that, again, communities are able to make decisions about things like that. Um, and I think kind of an, a good organizing question for me is thinking about how we go from our current polluting system, which is depicted on this slide at the top, to a system that um, is cleaner, that is more equitable, um, and better for more people that you know has solar on every home, a battery in every home, and that prioritizes energy efficiency um, overall. Next slide. Um, and so, you know, just thinking again, why does all of this matter? Well, we're all familiar with the fact that the energy system, as it's set up today, has contributed to climate change. Um, there's air and water pollution related to it. It's causing massive negative impacts to both environmental health, but also human health. Um, and we also know that low income and BIPOC communities are being disproportionately burdened uh, by the energy system as it's structured today. And I think a good example of that that's really close to home um, can be found in Charles City County, Virginia and Pennsylvania County, Virginia. Um, both of these places have been um, completely overburdened by um, pipeline infrastructure, power plants, gas compressors, compressor stations and things like that. Um, and so then secondly, um, the location of all of this matters because the benefits of the clean energy transition aren't guaranteed to be equitable. Um, and right now, you know, coal field communities are losing jobs and tax revenues as power plants are being shut down. Um, and so we need to be thinking about how we can support those communities as we make this necessary transition. Um, and then again, as we've seen through this really hot summer, um, during the cold freeze in Texas, uh, during the winter, access to energy, to solar, to batteries, to things like that can be literally life-saving for people. So um, yeah, that's, that's why we need to be able to make decisions about how all of this is structured. Yeah. One more slide, and then I'm gonna turn it over to my speakers. So next slide. Um, yeah, so just kind of in closing, energy democracy is a framework for an energy system that is more just that centers environmental and social justice um, and that prioritizes community decision-making. Um, it sounds really beautiful, sounds idealistic and utopian, um, but that's why we're here tonight with our wonderful speakers because I'm hoping that each of us will be inspired by their examples of folks who are actually working to build energy democracy um, in the real world. And so with that, um, we are going to turn things over to Joey James from Downstream downstream strategies, and I'm going to introduce him really quickly, and then he'll share his, his screen. So um, we're happy to have Joey with us tonight. He's from West Virginia. He's a multidisciplinary researcher who specializes in sustainable economic development and planning for the new economy related to the clean energy transition. He has professional experience in the public, nonprofit, and private sectors, and has worked extensively in energy policy analysis, geographic information system development, economic modeling, environmental data analysis, and environmental outreach. Most recently, Joey's work has centered on the strategic use of former mine sites and other underutilized land assets that can grow local economies. Um, he lives in the solar power home in Morgantown, West Virginia, and he's here with us tonight to talk about that last piece of um, unique opportunities on abandoned mine lands. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to Joey. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Emily, uh, for the, the introduction. Um, I'm not sure if people are aware, but there was actually another Appalachian Voices uh, hosted webinar tonight. Uh, it was on innovative economic development on former mine sites, and I was actually asked to speak at that one as well, but um, this one sounded a whole lot more exciting to me, and so um, here I am. I'm, I'm really excited to, to be here and share my experience transforming um, my former mine sites across the region into assets of the, uh, of the new economy. There I am. Uh, so before we dive in here, I just want to tell you a little bit about the organization I'm, I'm lucky enough to be a leader of. Um, Downstream Strategies is an environmental and economic development consulting firm. We're based in West Virginia. We have uh, four offices across West Virginia now, but really we do work all over the country and occasionally the world. Um, but we've, we've really honed in our skills as planners, researchers, and scientists by working to address the critical issues facing resource strapped Appalachian communities. Our clients consider us to be the, the go-to source for objective data-based analyses, plans and actions that strengthen economies, sustain healthy environments and build resilient communities. We have a, a solar powered office also, here you can see um, our, our headquarters in, in Morgantown. So today, uh, as, as Emily had, had mentioned, I'm gonna talk to you about some plans and actions downstream has been a part of that have really greatly advanced the conversation around utilizing former mine sites and other brownfields uh, for solar development. But before we dive into that, um, I think it's important to review some things about solar and particularly large scale solar in central Appalachia. So really, why would a person from West Virginia be so interested in solar? Um, well, the answer has to do uh, with this chart right here. Uh, this chart is the number of solar jobs in each of, of these selected states. So looking at this, who do you think the outlier here is? Who do you think is, is missing out on uh, economic development opportunities related to the new energy economy? Um, unfortunately, it's, it's West Virginia, nine times out of 10. Uh, and you can see here that the installed capacity within each of the states largely correspond with the, uh, the number of jobs that I showed there on the previous slide. Again, West Virginia is falling way behind its neighbors. Um, and you really know you're in trouble when you start falling behind uh, Kentucky on something. Uh, so we're, uh, we're really behind Kentucky there. But with uh, corporate investment uh, in renewable energy at an all time high, it's really important for a state like West Virginia to um, position itself to at least capture some of that um, investment. So you can see here, this is just um, corporate renewable energy deals from 2020. Um, corporations are investing massive amounts into, um, into renewable energy. And it's not just the high tech corporations. Um, Nucor and, and Evraz, those are, those are steel corporations. Um, so, you know, you have some traditional manufacturing, um, you know, businesses that are, are also uh, committing themselves to, to powering their operations or offsetting their, their emissions with renewable energy. So there are a couple other arguments for uh, large scale solar in, in central Appalachia. And these are ones that I've, I've come up with or that I've heard uh, throughout my time um, talking with folks. So I think there's a lot of arguments against large scale solar and we can talk about those later on. Um, but my arguments for large scale solar is that in a place like West Virginia or in a place like far Southwestern Virginia uh, is that large scale solar really publicly demonstrates the value of solar and it may really encourage uh, distributed systems. So. Just last week, I was in Montgomery, West Virginia, just outside of Charleston, up the Canal River. 
And I had someone tell me that he didn't think that solar worked in, in West Virginia. And he was, a, he was a lineman. I mean, so this is somebody that was working, you know, in the electric industry. Uh, and he truly believed that, that solar was not viable in, in a place like West Virginia. Now, a very public, large-scale installation of solar can help, you know, change those misconceptions. Solar, and this is the topic of our, the main topic of our uh, conversation here today, is an opportunity to make use of, of surplus, uh, underutilized, degraded land in Appalachia. So West Virginia has over 550 square miles of, of surface mine land, less than 2% of which has been put back to some sort of productive economic use. Um, and lastly, and this is one that, you know, I guess like pulls at the, the heartstrings of, of the, the traditional energy industry folks is that what better way to honor our region's rich heritage as an energy producer than to embrace the 21st century energy economy. But, uh, so that's a nice little intro there into, uh, into large scale solar. Now I wanna talk a little bit about mine sites and then we'll, we'll mix the two together. So central Appalachia, as you know, has a lot of surface mine sites. Just to give you an idea of what scale we're talking about here, here's a map of surface mine areas in West Virginia. So as I mentioned previously, over 550 square miles of land has been surface mined in West Virginia alone. And again, less than 2% of that is, is used today for some sort of uh, productive use. So I, I recognize that your average person doesn't spend a whole lot of time on former surface mines in rural areas. So let's talk about common characteristics of that 550 square mile area that I just uh, showed you on the, the map there. So you walk out onto a surface mine, typically you're dealing with a, a rocky, highly disturbed surface. Uh, there's a patchwork of, of flat and non-flat areas throughout the site. Typically you'll have areas that have been contoured out. Um, there's often unmitigated environmental problems that need addressed. Um, well, I shouldn't say often, there's always unmitigated environmental problems that need addressed. Um, there's usually vehicles and old equipment that can be found that were either left behind by the, the mine operator or locals that had dumped stuff there. Um, related to that, there's almost always locals that are using the site for recreation or hunting or, you know, they've, uh, they're usually up there. Um, there's mixed vegetation, kind of depends on the site. Sometimes you'll go onto a site that looks like the, the mine site there on the, the right where you have uh, some savanna grasses. Other times you'll, you might find, um, you know, a site that's completely covered in autumn olive. It really depends on the site, when it was mined and who did it. Um, there are, are water impoundments and wet areas usually on the larger surface mine. But most importantly, there is almost always uh, electrical infrastructure in place on the site that uh, was put in place when the mine was operating, um, but has since, you know, um, just sat out there. So here's a couple pictures of some surface mines. Um, this first one's in, uh, in Wise County, Virginia. This is actually a, a surface mine that is um, being pursued right now for, for solar development in Wise County. Um, this one is in northeastern Tennessee. This is a water impoundment on a surface mine. Um, there is some flat areas, but I just wanted to show you what those water impoundments look like. Um, and this is actually on that same site where the water impoundment was um, in northeastern Tennessee, um, you can see this massive flat area here. It's probably about 100 acres of, of, of flat as a pancake, barren land. Um, th this site has been um, completely reclaimed, um, quote unquote. <laughs> uh, 
And again, this is in northeastern Tennessee. So where did I get started on, or how did I get started on solar on my lands, mine lands? My journey with solar on mine lands actually started in a very unlikely place. Uh, back in 2015, with an increasing number of, of large scale solar facilities in the United States, I was interested in learning more about the, the process of siting those facilities and the decision making processes that developers went through because I recognized that these facilities were being developed all around West Virginia, but they weren't being developed in West Virginia. So I wanted to understand more about that decision-making process. So I attended a utility scale solar um, conference that was, uh, that was in Bowling Green, uh, Ohio. And there I was able to talk with some high level developers about the prospect of developing solar on former mine sites in Appalachia. And, you know, really, I left the conference feeling completely dejected. I learned that, you know, some of the largest solar developers had really no idea or interest um, in doing business in West Virginia or, or Central Appalachia at that time. They hadn't even considered that we had a bunch of mine sites that could be perfect for solar. It was it was really then that I knew that if we were going to attract any significant solar development to the region, especially on former mine lands, we needed to show them that it could work. So doing what I do best um, as a consultant, I, uh, I was able to find funding um, to, to basically um, you know, pay for my time to study the viability of former mine sites uh, for solar. Um, really that project had, had two goals. Uh, the, the first goal was to, to use standard siting analysis to show solar developers that solar could be developed on previously mined sites in West Virginia and, and more broadly across central Appalachia. Um, but also, you know, we wanted to start um, developing a value proposition to bring those solar jobs that I talked about <laughs> to my backyard here in, in, in West Virginia, in central Appalachia. So the, uh, the study took about six months. Um, so attended the conference, six months later, I have a number. Uh, so we found out that West Virginia has over 220 square miles of mine lands that are viable for large scale solar development. And these sites were vetted for topography, proximity to degraded roads, land use, land cover, and proximity to uh, electric infrastructure that could support the development. So we produced the report, put the report out, sent it to the developers that I had spoken to about six months ago. There was increased interest from the developers, but no bites. And so then I realized, okay, well, we have a huge policy problem that, <laughs> that needs to be addressed. Um, so that study um, really, uh, you know, was it snowballed very quickly into some significant policy changes that we've seen in West Virginia over the last couple of years. And one of the, one of the uh, I guess, tools that I had in my back pocket was that the co-author of the study and my colleague serves in the West Virginia House of Delegates. And so we were able to, um, you know, get bills uh, proposed fairly quickly. And, um, you know, and he definitely, he definitely understood, um, you know, the, the need for it. So let's talk about some of those bills and what happened. So the first bill that we had introduced, and this is the bill that really um, that really started the conversation about solar development on mine lands in West Virginia, was called the West Virginia Modern Jobs Act. And basically, what that bill uh, would have done is allowed power purchase agreements, which are illegal in in the state of West Virginia, or were. We'll get to that. Um, only if the solar was sited on a former mine site. 
Um, and so that got broad support from both Republicans and Democrats. So if you're not familiar with West Virginia politics, um, we have a Republican supermajority um, in, in both houses and a, and a Republican governor. Um, so you, you have to have Republican support to get these things through. It had Republican support, but um, AEP and First Energy, they have a lot of control and they stepped in and were able to get the bill defeated at the last minute. But, but they yeah. saw- He's enjoying it and he is. <laughs> but they saw that we were really close to getting it passed and they got scared. So the next, um, the next legislative session tw in 2020, um, there was another bill proposed and that bill was actually proposed by the utility, Senate Bill 583, which basically um, laid the foundation for the expedited development of 400 megawatts of utility scale solar on former mine lands. Utility owned utility scale solar on former mine lands, should say that. And that passed um, near unanimously. Uh, there was a there was, you know a few um, people that, that voted against it from the the southern coal fields, but the vast majority of people supported it. Now, during that <laughs> during that um, when the when they were voting at the very last minute, uh, a delegate almost amended in a um, an authorization of of power purchase agreements, and. Again, the utility saw that um, and there was support for it. They were able to, to tell that delegate not to, uh, not to do that. But the next cycle in 2021, we got power purchase agreements passed this last cycle in West Virginia. We don't know exactly what it's gonna look like yet, but power purchase agreements now are legal in West Virginia. And again, this all started because of our conversation about <laughs> about solar on mine lanes. And I should add that, you know, that is still um, a, a center point of the, the solar development conversation here in West Virginia. So we have five gigawatts now of solar in the queue and a substantial amount of that solar is slated to be developed on former mine sites. Just to give you an idea of how substantial that is, uh, two years ago, we had nothing in the queue. We had nothing, <laughs> not uh, you know, not a single utility scale development. So to have five gigawatts and dozens now of of large scale solar um, developments in the queue, it's uh, it's kind of like a complete uh, one hundred and eighty. So again, uh, this started a conversation across our region about developing solar on former mine sites and has had a uh, kind of a, a waterfall effect. So um, one example of that, and this is one that you might have heard of before. Um, so I work with Appalachian Voices' Norton office over in the southwestern part of the state on identifying innovative projects that can be cited on former mine sites. Um, and one of the projects that we identified in the very first year of doing that was a, was a large scale solar facility that could be constructed adjacent to a data center um, in Wise County. And we were able to get grant funds to support that project and get that project off the ground it's actually under construction right now as we speak. And that is the first large scale solar development on a mine site in Appalachia. And so that is, that's huge, that's huge. That's the proof of concept that I had talked about needing at the very beginning of this. Um, so this last um, general assembly uh, session, um, House Bill 1925, the Virginia Brownfield and Coal Mine Renewable Energy Grant Fund um, was, was established. 
And that's a grant fund to basically offset the additional costs because there are additional costs that, that you incur from developing on a, on a mine site or a, on a brownfield. They're worth it, in my opinion, but um, to offset those additional costs um, for, for developers. So that's uh, Virginia's kind of sweetened the deal now. And you can bet that we're going to try to propose something very similar in West Virginia uh, next session. And then if any of you have been following the Nature Conservancy's large land acquisition in southwestern Virginia and eastern Kentucky, they got 253,000 acres of, of land. Um, and there's about, uh, you know, 11 or so large surface mines within the boundaries of this property that they acquired. Um, actually, these two pictures are taken on those surface mines within within that property. And um, they have contracted with, with two solar developers, one being Sun Tribe Solar out of Charlottesville uh, to develop solar on these sites. Um, and again, this is, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't have imagined uh, when, when I started into the solar on my lands conversation that we'd be where we are today and getting the significant projects that that were that we are getting. So uh, thank you everybody for for your time and uh, you can go ahead and turn it back over to Emily. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Um, that was really excellent um, and exciting to hear kind of the beginning of this story to where we are now. Um, and we're really grateful for your work um to advance projects like that in central appalachia so will everyone if you have questions for joey please hold them um, or you can put them in the chat if you're afraid you're going to forget um, we will have a q a at the end um, of tonight but i want to turn things over to our next presenter um taylor lily from the chesapeake bay foundation is with us tonight um so welcome taylor she works to develop litigation to address disproportionate environmental impacts on vulnerable and marginalized communities as part of this work, Taylor works with departments across the Chesapeake Bay Foundation to develop relationships with community leaders and grassroots organizers throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed. She earned her Juris Doctor from the University of Maryland School of Law in 2018, where she received a Certificate of Concentration in Environmental Law. While in law school, Taylor worked with the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, and the Maryland Environmental Law Clinic participated in joint partnership between the University of Maryland and the Arava Institute and worked with the University of Malawi Chancellor College of Law, Environmental Justice and Sustainability Clinic. She is an active member of the District of Columbia Bar um, and has been very involved in some really um, good work in Virginia. And I'll turn things over to Taylor. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I was really excited to join today when Emily mentioned that Today it was partially about success stories because we're, or at least we in the advocacy around Charles City County are recently coming off a success story, but I won't get ahead of myself. I'll save that for a little bit. So when I first started at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, my boss, our, our vice president for litigation was just moving forward with the Buckingham case. And I'm so attuned to Buckingham, Emily, as soon as you put that map up, all I could see was Buckingham County. So for those of you who don't know, when the Atlantic Coast Pipeline was still moving along, there was a proposed compressor station for Buckingham County, Virginia. And that compressor station was going to be sited in a community that was founded by freed slaves and whose descendants had continued to make a home in that community for generations. And that community found out, as many communities do, at various points along the process, some later in, in the approval, some when they got letters saying that the pipeline would be crossing their driveways, but the stories were all the same. They heard that this facility was coming and they were in opposition, but they wanted to get involved. And one of the main stories in environmental justice is ensuring that regulators take those stories seriously. And so when I first came on the scene and the conversations about ACP and the compressor station were moving forward, there was a lot of attention paid to the narrative that was being pushed or that and that was being accepted by regulators. So when ACP was applying for its permit, the main story was there are no impacts to this community and it's not a predominantly African American community. Don't worry about the environmental justice impacts. There are none. And if that narrative had been allowed to survive, that community would have had a much different outcome than what they did. 
but because the community and advocates chose to challenge the issuance of the permit for that facility, the narrative on the record had a chance to change. So while the regulators and the applicant would have people believe that the community was made up of 38% people of color, 38% minorities, a door-to-door -door study, a door -to -door study actually showed that it was made of 83% people of color, even though the applicant said PM 2.5, that the main pollutant that the compressor station would be emitting was not harmful. We were able to submit evidence on the record that shows that that small particle is extremely harmful, not to people in general, but also particularly to African-Americans. And so the narrative that goes along with these facilities is equally as important because that is a way in which communities are able to actively participate in the siting of these facilities. For a long time, those stories have been on the back burner and the public participation aspects have been lip service at most. But after Buckingham and after the Fourth Circuit case that came after that, we had not only the, st the stories of the communities, not only the voice of the communities, but the voice of the court saying, you must do environmental justice reviews. These stories do matter. This, the accuracy of this narrative matters. And in Virginia, it is the duty of the Air Board to consider the accuracy of the information on the record and to consider the actual story of the community that's present. And so I had just started at CBF and this was sort of a huge win, completely changed what it meant to talk about environmental justice in Virginia, what it meant to do and to talk about energy infrastructure in Virginia and particularly the siting of infrastructure. Buckingham was one and was founded based on one particular regulation in the state's air pollution control board law, section 1307E, just call it the site suitability regs that says you have to determine the character and degree of injury to a particular community when you're, when you're reviewing a permit, when the air board in particular is reviewing a permit. And so the charge as of late has been to carry Buckingham forward and ensure that the court and all the communities who are relying on that opinion get to see it implemented and ensure that the, those duties and those stories make it onto the record. So Emily mentioned earlier, Charles City County, and I've been at CBF for two years and, all, and for almost those entire two years, I've been working in Charles City County on one and a half plants and a pipeline. So I'm gonna sh try and share a little visual now. It might not work. So if we're, not, we're just gonna go with the flow if it doesn't. Okay. So this is a little overview of Charles City County. This is obviously not the entire county, but just by way of background, Charles City County is predominantly African-American. It's low income. It's got a low, an income percentage that's lower than both the Commonwealth as a whole, but also lower than the US. And a lot of residents don't have access to broadband internet. That was not a public participation issue in particular when everything started, but since COVID, that has become the predominant form, the way we communicate, just like we are now. And so when, we, when I talk about one of the other facilities, that was a huge issue in terms of communities being able to participate in the process because a lot of members weren't able to join the community, join the public participation process. And it also ended up in you know, some, a lot of back and forth about whether or not the regulator had a duty to add these additional opportunities. So in 2016, C4GT, the station here, a natural gas fired power plant made its first proposition. And this was before Buckingham, pre-Buckingham. And when C4GT went before the State Corporation Commission, that, that entity that Emily mentioned earlier, it received one public comment, went through the process without any opposition. And C4GT, in a way, sailed through all of its air permit review and made its way into Charles City County. Now, it's disappointing, but what makes it even more frustrating is about a year and a half later, the Chickahominy power station came on the scene and you can see they're pretty close. They're about less than a mile apart from each other. Combined, I think the, the, narr the story that I heard, at least the numbers that I saw is that the, these two combined facilities would be the fifth largest power plant in the US based on their emissions. And all of it was coming to Charles City County. And what's more, all of the energy that was being generated by these facilities was not actually going to Charles City County. It was going to be sold on the PJM inter interconnect line. So we were seeing this, this, this community take the burden of pollution, but not reap any of the benefits. And so by the time that CBS got engaged, Chickahominy had already gotten its air permit at the exact same time as Buckingham. So all of those great, and all of that great information and all of those great procedures that came out of Buckingham were not in place when Chickahominy and C4GT 
had gotten its permit at the time, but we were there for the water for the state water control board because Virginia's got a lot of citizen boards and the water board was reviewing the groundwater permit. And so when I first went to that meeting, it was one of my first actual duties for CBF and I was listening in the public meeting and one of the community members got up for the mic and said, the first time I heard about this power station was when I saw the notice or when I heard, got the notice for this meeting. So at that point, Chickahominy had already gone before the SEC. It had already gotten an air permit and it was well into the review for its water permit. And when they mentioned that they had run an actual ad in the paper about Chickahominy letting everybody know, someone said, well, that ad ran the day after Christmas. And I didn't check the paper the day after Christmas because I didn't think anybody would be putting anything important into the paper on that time. And so there was a large part of the community that had not got gotten an opportunity to be involved in the process and to have their, their opinion put on the record and to express their concerns to the regulatory boards. And in my work, that's been a huge issue because like I said, those narratives are important. Without them, the applicant gets to tell the story, they get to say who's impacted, they get to say how bad it will be, and then they get to tell you how beneficial it's gonna be and how economically beneficial it is for the Commonwealth and just sell as, as whatever they need to to keep moving. And so when Chickahominy was on, on the line, that story was already embedded in regu regulators' memory and it was moving forward. And so unfortunately, Chickahominy got its water permit and we were very frustrated. And on top of that, as if that wasn't enough, we also got the proposed VNG pipeline. So VNG was proposed to bring gas to C4GT, that first power station. So for those keeping track, Charles City County a rural county that did not have an express need for this energy infrastructure got two natural gas fired power plants and a pipeline in addition to the, the landfill that they were already working with in their community. And so when VNG went for the SEC, we grassroots advocates and the community went to and the SEC, the State Corporation Commission, Emily was talking about them earlier, they mainly d deal with energy rates and just the regulation of the business entity in general. So when we showed up to talk about environment, environmental justice, it wasn't exactly what they wanted to hear or were prepared to hear, but Virginia had just passed the Clean Economy Act and the Environmental Justice Act and updated its energy plan. And all of those things touched on the SEC and also brought environmental justice into the conversation. One of the, again, one of the most important things for EJ and for community advocacy is to get that language into the into regulation and to get it before regulators and to make it a formal part of the conversation. So when we went before the SEC, we being all the environmental organizations and citizens and grassroots advocates, we talked about environmental justice and we talked about the impact communities and the fact that the applicant hadn't done its job providing the SEC with enough information about how it would impact these communities and talking about what it would do to prevent impacts. And we don't know whether it's the first time, there's no way to really go back through all these opinions, but it was definitely a rare occasion when the SEC finally put out its opinion. They had actual conditions on VNG to pursue environmental justice and not just, hey, you should do environmental justice, but give us an entire list of all the ways you need to comply with environmental justice based on current laws and how you're going to do that. And that was great news, but an even better news, C4GT, one of those plant started showing its true financially irresponsible colors and was unable to participate in the project. They couldn't show where their, their funding was. They weren't responding to any information. And so in December, right before VNG had to say, okay, we'll meet your conditions, SDC, they canceled the project and said, we're no, we can't meet your conditions. We're, we're not going forward, which was very exciting. I think there's an official VNG interconnect cancellation day. I don't, I just may, might know what the date is, but Either way, I'll be celebrating it sometime around December every year. And then again, because these plants are not always financially viable, C4GT started showing even more problems. The day before its permit was set to expire, the very, very last day, they poured concrete for a fire pad so they could say they started construction. And then after that, they still hadn't paid VNG or set up anything in their contract. And so VNG sued them and took them to court. And as much as I love, Taking with, uh, confronting these entities, it's even better when they confront each other and you can kind of sit back and watch. And so BNG said, you owe us all of this money, you owe us $2 million because you failed to participate in this contract. And C4GT said nothing. And 
just from a general legal perspective, it's really rare that a viable company will refuse to respond to an actual suit in court and say nothing. But as they said in their docket, C4GT had been completely silent, hadn't responded to any requests. And so they got a default judgment saying, yes, okay, you do owe this money. Let's move forward after that. And so then C4GT in its, in its new fashion stopped responding to the Department of Environmental Quality and sending its status updates as supposed to. And after a long series of cancellations, including the Board of Supervisors in Charles City County saying, we want this land back since you're not doing anything with it, C4GT announced two Fridays ago, so about like two, almost two weeks ago, that it was also canceling that project. And so huge win. Now we've got C4GT cancellation day. But most importantly, at least most importantly to me, in that statement saying they're canceling the project, C4GT said, in response to concerns from the community, they also said market drivers, but the community is the important part to me because the residents of Charles City County appreciated the rural nature of their community. They loved their community and they never asked for any of this infrastructure. And overnight, they had to, they had to militarize themselves and turn into advocates for their community and find the time, the effort, and the willpower to engage in these conversations. And so to see all of their work reflected in that statement and that cancellation is motivation to keep going. And unfortunately, they need it because even though C4GT is canceled, Chickahominy still exists. And landowners had just started getting letters from Chickahominy Pipeline so that there can be a pipeline to feed the Chickahominy. And so when I think about success stories, energy, democracy, and in conjunction with environmental justice, it's sort of bittersweet because I've had the pleasure to work with a lot of communities who are tireless advocates for themselves and who have refused to let their narratives be adopted and co-opted by applicants. But even when that fight reaches the point that you hope for, when you get that success story, sometimes there's still more left to go. Buckingham has had to respond to gold mining incidences and, Ch and Charles City County has now had to move forward and think about how to organize around the Chickahominy pipeline after going through all three of these facilities. And like Emily mentioned in Pennsylvania County, the MVP Lambert Compressor Station is now coming for a small community that looks a lot like Buckingham. And that community, like Charles City County, had previously been fighting the Transco Compressor Station that's already there. And so we've got all of these communities working to make sure that their narratives go, get before regulators and that regulators find a way to take those stories and take the facts that are before them and confront the applicant and all the applications that are before them and address the issues. Because the fact is that communities' lives and their health is on the line when they go before these regulatory bodies, when they present these issues. And if they don't have sufficient information to make those decisions, then there's, just, there's an injustice done to those communities. And but I continue to be inspired by communities because they have an an unfortunate it's unfortunate that they have to have it but they have a tireless amount of energy to share their stories and ensure that we're uplifting the, the, those stories and so as advocates as those outside the community it's been our role to even when we're not representing a particular person to make sure that those stories are elevated and that those stories come before those regulators and that we get to present and the more accurate narrative, the story of those communities to regulators who are doing these permits. And so as we pursue the future of energy democracy, I think it's always important to remember that social justice piece, remember that community narratives are essential and that there's no way to move forward without those stories. And so I'll wrap it up there because it kind of feels like I, I've, I've ranted on, on it a bit, but just a last congratulations to Charles City County and hopefully there are a lot of congratulations on the forefront for more communities like them. Thank you, Taylor. Um, it's something that comes to mind just in thinking about communities engaging in these fights and then another fight cropping up somewhere else. I mean, I think you see, you see those communities that have been successful supporting people elsewhere too, which is really inspiring and kind of points to that piece of the need to, to grow this movement um, and continue um, working together and supporting each other. Um, thank you so much for that. Again, we'll save well, some time for a question and answer at the end. Um, I do wanna turn things over to Queen Shabazz of the Virginia Environmental Justice Collaborative. Um, I am going to introduce her really quickly and then she I think is gonna share a video at some point. So um, 
Queen is an author, educator, lecturer, and environmental justice advocate. Her work began in 1996 when she discovered that her young son had been poisoned by lead, prompting her to establish the United Parents Against Lead, a national networking organization that works to end the threat of lead poisoning and other environmental hazards through education and awareness, advocacy, intervention, and resource referral. In addition to serving as executive director of that organization, Shabbat, Queen Shabazz is a local Stand for Children organizer, a position she's held since 1996. She currently serves as the coordinator of the Virginia Environmental Justice Collaborative and is a member of the Lead Service Line Replacement Collaborative. Queen is an inaugural community partner, partners in residence fellow at the University of Richmond and a former elementary school teacher. As an advocate for adult liter literacy, she has served as a Reed Center board member and, the advisory, and on the advisory board of the Senate Joint Subcommittee studying lead poisoning prevention. She continues to provide valuable insight, time, and dedication towards the eradication of lead poisoning. Um, Queen also holds a bachelor's degree in business administration and a paralegal certificate specializing in real estate and civil litigation. She is a notary public and a 2019 graduate of the EPA's Environmental Justice Academy. And we are incredibly honored to have Queen um, who is such an advocate for environmental justice um, and has been for so long with us tonight. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to, to Queen. Thank you, Emily. I'm honored to, to be in this space and share this space with you all. We're gonna, I am going to share a short um, slide presentation. <laughs> So I'm going to start with um, partnering. Let's see, present. All right. Partnering for resilient communities. And this was recently shared at the um, Solar for Justice National Gathering just just last week. <laughs> so um, partnering for resilient communities. We talk about um, energy democracy and environmental justice and how the two actually are linked. So for us at the collaborative, environmental justice is more than the natural, the air, water, and land, but it must also include the cultural, social, economic and political components of a community. So the whole of a community. And in that sense, environmental justice is aligned with um, energy democracy as a political, economic, social, and cultural concept. Um, it merges, and energy democracy merges technological and energy transition. It strengthens democracy and public participation. Um, so community ownership. And we go from this to this, to this, to getting our energy directly from the sun. So I'm gonna talk about um, where our, the community where our um, solar power community resiliency hub is located. It's a community called the Heights and some uh, very adjacent to um, Ravenscroft community in Petersburg, Virginia. So our hub is also historical and is slated to be placed on the state and national listing of historic sites because it was at one time used for um, colored USO army troops. Um, during military segregation. So we're going to look at a short video before I continue. So you get to actually have this introduction to the hub. Wait one second. <laughs> I have to exit the screen. Oh, Lord. Give me one moment. <clears throat> Thank you. 
I mean, I don't think we can hear it. It's silent. Oh, okay. There's Great. no sound. Makes it easy. Mm -hmm. So our national recognition application is will be heard in December, with the Department of Historic Resources. Oops. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the slides. <laughs> And so what is a resiliency hub? Um, our Petersburg Resiliency Hub will actually be the first solar powered community resiliency hub in Virginia. It will operate as a one-stop center to provide resources and offer um, safe haven during storms, heating and cooling centers, provide clean water, nutritious food, and be a connection to the retired veterans. As we said, it is a, it was a used as an old USO building for the colored army troops. All right, and what is resiliency? We're also going to have a community advisory board the Resiliency Hub provides communities an opportunity and the means to react and respond to disasters in the least disruptive way, rather than drowning in floodwaters or waiting on rooftops to be rescued, as we have seen much too often in sacrifice zone communities. So we'll have a community advisory board that will dictate the activities that go on at the Hub. Resiliency is community-based and community-led, and we're going to shift the power back into the hands of the community, including our community-controlled funding, taking and maintaining ownership and the right to self-determination. We are going to um, go from intentionally divested communities to resilient, self-sufficient communities. We offer these types of trainings that you see on the screen in our um, Richmond trainings, community training center now. So community emergency response training certification, um, CPR, AED and first aid, lead and mold inspect and remediator training and certification, as well as DMV driver improvement and escort vehicle training certification towards self-sufficiency and entrepreneurship. And the possibilities are endless. We are going to offer green jobs training, including solar PV panel assembly and installation. So um, we heard a lot about in the, in the previous um, presentation, a lot about, um, I guess, large scale um, solar. Our project is, is not considered large scale. And, and because of that, we actually had a hard time getting anyone to, uh, to take the bid to come in and install the PV solar um, panels. We um, really pushed hard for this to be a community project. And so we're having 
um, people from the community to do the actual work. And that's been um, skilled laborers that live right next door down the street, right in the community. Um, it's been black and brown um, uh, construction companies that you saw doing the roofing, um, doing the plumbing, doing the electrical work, everything um, was, was um, people that were from the community and to empower them to, for these, this work to be respected and know that um, you know, we are able to um, provide these services for our community. We will also be a source of um, clean water distribution because Petersburg has a lot of boil water warnings, a lot of um, flooding, a lot of problems um, you know, with, the, with the water infrastructure. We'll also provide things like um, labyrinths, um, green spaces to address trauma and um, mental wellness and uh, mental well-being, um, and towards complete community solar, which um, that's going to take some convincing our elected officials to to see the benefits of community solar. So we're hoping that our hub will be that beacon of light um, and be a start in the um, the Heights community. Um, even um, cooking with solar ovens I, and drinking from um, solarized hydro panels. I wanted to go back to the oven. I was actually one, one of these ovens during a presentation, um, an energy presentation. I was um, gifted with one of these ovens from She Inc. organization. So we'll be demonstrating these types of ovens at the hub and seeing if we can make them available to families who um, are just spending too much on electrical bills, you know, if they're cooking with electric or gas. Um, renewable drinking water, solarized hydro panels, we are talking to a company about also having these installed at the hub uh, because of the water issues that I talked about earlier. We even had an incident in, in Petersburg where we had the collaborative, the Virginia Environment and Justice Collaborative had to appeal to the health commissioner because people's water was actually turned off during the pandemic while the elected officials in Petersburg were saying to you know be more clean, wash your hands, practice cleanliness, but at the same time we're shutting people's water off. So we had to appeal to the health commissioner who ordered the city to turn everybody's water back on. So we think that um, this would definitely alleviate those problems that people, um, you know, who were laid off and could not afford to pay the bills because they weren't getting paid any salaries during the pandemic. Um, this will alleviate um, having to worry about water. They will at least have some, some, some clean drinking water. So this is the hub under construction. The front of the building is, is nearly complete now. This is how it's more looking. It's even looking different than this. Now my husband sent me some pictures today from the site. And our hub is made possible by support from um, the Institute for Sustainable Communities, um, technical assistance from the Clean Energy Group, which allowed us to conduct a feasibility study. And Hanut Foundation is paying for the complete um, solar PV um, installation. We are in the process of acquiring additional funding because we want it to be, um, to be able to store energy through batteries. And the batteries are quite expensive. And so um, we are raising funds for that. We want our hub to be able to operate during a time of a climate crisis, you know, a power outage to be to able to operate for at least five days. And so therefore we need to be able to, to store the energy. And this is the hub is being preserved in honor of the brave men and women who fought and died for a country that did not fight for them. USO Colored Troops of Petersburg, Virginia. And that's our contact information. United Parents Against Lead is the organization that I founded 
actually own, own the building where the hub is located and we are in partnership with the collaborative to get it up and running and to maintain and operate um, as a community solar power resiliency hub. Thank you all. Wonderful. Um, I mean, that's such good, inspiring work. Thank you for sharing about that um, project that I'm just really excited to hear about. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank um, you for us to visit it. <laughs> yeah, I would love to do that. Being there, yes. Um, awesome. Well, it's 6.45. Um, we're a little bit, we're getting just a little bit behind schedule. So I want to shift quickly to um, Q&A. So if anyone has questions um, that you'd like to ask, we can just come off chat. Oh, I see Josh has his hand up. He's ready. Um, Josh? Yeah, um, I, I was wondering uh, if there was a plan to, to try to help um, the people who were on the like mined lands who were who the families of the miners and and who's who got uh you know their work from the from the mine lands uh if if we're trying to like train them in solar uh in the solar industry is that a, a project absolutely absolutely and that's that's one thing that unfortunately I didn't have enough time to talk about um but the a lot of the skills and equipment operating skills um, that the, the workers that actually, you know, were employed at these mine sites, um, have, um, are easily transferable to the large scale solar industry. Um, the, the issue is, is that, you know, you kind of have to have the, a critical amount of, of facilities to construct in order to make it be a, a, a sustainable job. And so that is that has been the challenge. Um, if you look at the state of Ohio, there was a, a study done a few years ago. It was called the Appalachian Ohio um, Solar. I think it was called Solar Job Study. Appalachian Ohio Solar Job Study. But basically, what they what they looked at was what what is the critical amount of solar needed in order to support um, you know a, a, a significant number of jobs in manufacturing, but also in installation. What they found was that you need at least 400 megawatts in a, in a pretty focused area in order to kind of support the ecosystem of solar jobs, large scale solar jobs. Um, and luckily the state of Ohio, they, they had some legislation that passed years ago, or it was actually a settlement with AEP and the Sierra Club um, where they basically said, you know, AEP is going to install 400 megawatts and we're going to figure out how to attract some manufacturing jobs and they've done a really good job at it. Um, we're in the process in southwestern Virginia, far southwest Virginia, so seven county coalfield region in Virginia, um, of, of trying to do something similar. It's, um, are you trying to get fun? Um, sorry. Oh, I didn't I mean to cut you question. off. Go ahead, Josh. Um, I, I, other people go, uh, if, if I have a question. Okay. And you can always type your question into the chat. Um, so too. my follow-up was, uh, um, uh, are you trying to get funding from, uh, from the, uh, like, um, on the federal level, uh, uh in like the new clean energy bills that are trying to get passed? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So we've actually gotten some Appalachian Regional Commission funding, or we haven't, um, Appalachian Voices is involved in a, in a project with, uh, the, it's called the Solar Worker for Southwest Virginia, and they've done a really good job pulling in um, Appalachian Regional Commission funding and other private foundation funding to kind of um, look into, into building that, that local workforce um, to reap all of the economic benefits that, you know, that this opportunity, solar on mine lands, uh, has to offer. Thanks for your question, Jess. It's important to, I think, consider all the different ways that the clean energy transition can benefit um, communities. So it's definitely um, right up there with just the generation and resources themselves. Um, I want to go to a question from Clyde in the chat, and then we'll get to Cassidy. 
Um, Clyde, did you want to come off mute and ask your question? Um, sure. I was, uh, I, I see that there's a link in the chat for the answer, but I was wondering um, how is the area defined for an environmental justice community? Because I know, because from what I understand, the environmental justice community is defined by whether or not there is a larger percentage of um, uh, population of color in that area than in Virginia as a whole. But I don't understand. But I don't understand like how the area is defined. Sure. So I did put the link in the chat, but when you usually the information you're looking at is in census tracts. And so that's the area that is used for reference. And so it's the census tract, but also the area of impact. And the area of impact is where a lot of the conversation and discussion happens because, for example, what in 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 the MVP Lambert discussion, there's been a lot of conversation about the fact that the, the MVP is just that the impacted area is one mile. So in that case, the applicant is then suggesting that we look at the census tracts within one mile of a facility. Now, if, you're lo if you consider how far pollution travels, you might be looking at the census tracts within five miles or 10 miles of a facility. And so within those census tracts, then you apply the Virginia Environmental Justice Act in Virginia to determine the existence, the present presence of a community of color, the presence of a low-income community, the presence of a fence line community, and it's important to remember that yes, community of color is an aspect of environmental justice communities, but low-income community is also one of the designations. And so, when we're having this conversation about environmental justice. Yes, communities of color are predominantly driving that conversation because race is one of the driving factors of where those where facilities are sited in the United States, but low-income communities are also a significant driver in that conversation as well. Thanks, Taylor. And I added a link to a really cool tool that um, was just released um, and that Queen and the Virginia Environmental Justice Collaborative were instrumental in helping to develop, which can help you find um, EJ communities around the state of Virginia. So I encourage um, everyone to check that out. Um, Cassidy, we'll go to you. Thanks, Emily. Um, and thanks, everyone. Really interesting um, discussions this evening. My question is for Taylor. I was curious, um, I read recently, I think in, in the Richmond Times Dispatch that the developer of the pipeline that's supposed to go um, connect to, you know, eventually the, the, the Chickahominy plant really blamed the increase in demand on data centers, but so many of those companies have, you know, commitments to powering their operations with renewable energy, or at least are moving in that direction. Um, and I was curious if you had heard anything from those companies um, or from the data center coalition um, sort of debunking that claim. I haven't heard anything yet, and we probably won't hear anything until but until Chickahominy goes before the SEC, if that's eventually the body that they are before, I think there's still some question whether or not they'll be before the SEC because of sort of the makeup of who owns it and who they're trying to serve. It's not a public utility. And so there, there's all that to consider, but a lot of the claims that we're, that we're seeing from Chickahominy, we won't be able to verify and comment on until they start having to submit information along with their application. We saw this with VNG. There are a lot of suggestions about how beneficial the pipeline and the energy would be for the community. One of the claims that they made was that there was a there was a need for additional capacity to support communities in the area, and that was one of the driving factors for the pipeline, which turned out to be inaccurate. C4GT was driving 96% 96 of the demand. And so before we had all those numbers, we couldn't confirm that that was an inaccurate statement. And I think that's the same thing that we're seeing here because Chickahominy as a pipeline is just starting up, there's a lot of uncertainty around what will happen. And that's particularly frustrating for landowners and community members who are trying to advocate against it or protect their property or consider their future along the pipeline because they don't have all of the information out, but they do have letters saying that Chickahominy would like to come on their property. So hopefully we'll, we'll have a lot more data and you know, watch for some updates from the community and Apple Mad and Virginia, the Virginia Chapter of Sierra Club always do a really good job of getting that data out there too. Great, thanks Cassidy and thanks Taylor. Um, are there any more questions? Maybe we can take one more before we end things for tonight. 
like to ask one, if I may. Yeah, go right ahead, Queen. <laughs> um, regarding the, the abandoned mines, and, and you were driving across the state, you see a lot of, I guess, solar farms that are, they say, are owned by Dominion. How do we stop Dominion from purchasing those mines or scooping those up, you know, to claim for themselves? Yeah, so that's one of the that's one of the challenges that that we face in I guess all of the Appalachian states is that the owners of the mine properties oftentimes are are linked um, to the the coal industry, and um, they're looking at investments that they're making. These land holding companies that hold the properties, they're looking at investments on multi-generational <laughs> scales, you know, uh, and they are, some of them are unwilling to, to sell, to sell the property. With the decline of coal though, we are seeing some land holding companies start to buckle like the one that the Nature Conservancy got the 253,000 acres from in uh, Southwestern Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, uh, Northern Tennessee. And I think, that the situation that we're in really underlies the importance of these organizations, these big organizations that are um, allies like the Nature Conservancy, we really need to lean on those guys to, to step up to the plate when the situation arises that these properties come on the market. Because you can't find anybody to buy 200, I don't know anybody <laughs> that I could call to buy 253,000 acres of land um, and so, I mean, that's, that just goes to, to say, you know, the, the coalitions that we're, that we're building to, um, to shape our future, um, you know, they need to include people at the grassroots level, but we also need to bring in those people that, um, you know, that might have the, the money and, and political power to, uh, to pull something like that off, because I think that project's going to be a game changer. The work must continue. Um, given the time, I think we'll, I'll make a couple of announcements and then we'll end it. Um, but before I make those announcements, I just want to, again, send a huge thanks to Joey, Queen, and Taylor for their time tonight, um, for their expertise, and for their passion uh, for this work. Um, which is so important. And I really admire all of the work y'all are doing and I'm really pleased that we were able to um, have this conversation tonight. So thank you. Um, then quickly in terms of, of my announcements, so the final event in our series, which will focus on um, energy democracy, the pillar related to how much power costs and the affordability will be on August 30th, same time, 5.30. Uh, we'll be partnering with Clean Virginia uh, on this event um, and bringing in folks who are talking about problems with energy affordability and potential solutions and um, successful campaigns where people are fighting to make sure that um, all people are able to access electricity. Um, so again, that'll be on August 30th. Um, stay tuned for Facebook events and Zoom links and all of that. Um, love to see you all there. Um, and then the second thing that I wanted to um, raise up is that um, I'm leading an energy democracy working group or um, cohort of volunteers, people from all around Virginia whose utilities are range from Appalachian Power to Bark Electric Co-op to Dominion, who, um, you know, we get together once a month, we meet at five on the second Wednesdays just to learn about our energy system, to have conversations.